Before we begin the uh, lecture tonight and continue from the discussion we had last night, I'd like to congratulate all of you and on behalf of all of us, uh, Imam Mahdi Ajalallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif on the grand occasion of the birth of his grand uncle, Imam Hassan al Mujtaba, alayhi salam, inshallah, so that our dear Imam hastens his reappearance and for uh, having all of our marhumin be uh, with uh, Imam Hassan, alayhi salam, on this grand night uh, in heaven, please send a loud salawat. So last night we started with the discussion of uh, the responsibilities of the Qur'an from the ayahs of the Qur'an. And we came and said that to really understand the ayahs of the Qur'an, we need to strip away some of the foundation and uncover some of the hidden patterns uh, that are present within some of these ayahs. To really be able to understand what exactly um, the Qur'an is trying to get at us both directly and indirectly. The ayah we chose to focus on was one that Hajj Hassanain had began in his, uh, his lecture series on the first 10 nights, Surah Isra, ayahs number 9 and 10. We started with the discussion of uh, the fact that Allah in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Qur'an and three specific responsibilities that the Qur'an has. The first one we said was, Yahdi lillati hiya aqwam. The second one we said was يُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا And then the last one, which it left the verb out, it left out the action of its responsibility, was وَأَنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ أَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا We started to talk about last night that first one. يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَى We said that among all of the different times Yahdi is used in the Qur'an, it's about 74 times. 72 times it's allocated to the subject of Allah SWT, which means the person or being that is doing the hidayat is Allah. And only two times does the verb in the present tense, which signified continuity, show up for the Qur'an. The first time is in Surah Isra. The second time was in Surah Jinn. In Surah Jinn, we said that the Jinn had heard some Qur'an. That Qur'an, most Mufassirin believed to be the Holy Qur'an. They were surprised. And then they believed, Yahdi ila rushd That the words that they had heard that surprised them would bring about their elevation. So we understood the purpose of the Qur'an. And particularly from the aspect of its responsibility of Hidayat, we understood that... Uh, one of the groups that it is here to guide is the jinn. We also saw from Surah Zomar that people are also encompassed in the guidance of the Quran. The ayah says, وَلَقَدْ ضَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ That in this Quran we have brought examples for all mankind. All mankind. It doesn't specify it to mu'mineen, nor does it specify it to munafiqeen, nor does it specify it to muttaqeen. It's linnas, for everybody. And we said about what? Min kulli mathal. It has examples for everything. We brought examples from the social aspect. We brought uh, examples from the financial aspect in Ers and in Khums. We brought examples from the religious aspect in terms of what we should believe, the rituals of namaz and hajj. 
We brought examples from the political aspect in the way Hazrat Musa dealt with Fir'aun, in the way Prophet Yusuf dealt with uh, his responsibilities when he became uh, the vizier to the, uh, the, the pharaoh or, or the, the, the king at the time. And uh, we also said it brings about uh, good morals and, and lessons from both a, a personal and uh, family issue. So it has all topics covered. It has, it's here for all people. It's here for jinn. It has a different set of requirements and some responsibilities that it brings for jinn, but because I do not believe any of us are jinn, we don't worry about that at this point in time. And then we started to talk about how. How does the Quran bring the guidance? And that's where we ended last night with this uh, ayah from Surah Ala Imran, ayah number seven. هو الذي أنزل عليك الكتاب منه آيات محكمات هنا أم الكتاب We said that the way it does it is it has a set of direct verses where uh, it sets a foundation, a core, and that's the bulk of the book. That's the أم الكتاب. That's the essence of the book. And we learned at the way the Quran handles its responsibilities is at first defines itself a core, a foundation, something very direct, a set of principles. Why? Because this set of principles can't be wishy-washy. The set of principles can't change over time. The morals have to be fixed. I think Haj Hassanin had it in his lecture as well, that you can't have a set of morals that change over time. It's not uh, what's good is good. The being good should be good Today should be good 100 years from now. Should be good 100 years before. What is good, that could be different. But the principle of doing good, having good akhlaq, should be true regardless of time, regardless of person. So we ended last night on the discussion of وَأُخَرُوا mutashabihat. We came and said that mutashabihat is something that is, uh, brings about similarity. The only way you can have similarity is if you have two objects. Object number one, object number two, and some function that gives you the, the difference or the distance between object number one and object number two. And this is where a lot of science and math and computer science uh, and essentially everybody that I know focuses in, in at their work. It employs thousands to thousands to thousands to maybe even millions of people today across many labs of research to be able to identify what is a good measure of similarity between two points. And that's where revolutions occur. That's where you try to identify patterns in uh, genetic diseases to come and identify biomarkers that you could target for a specific therapeutic. That's where you can identify in cybersecurity data when you're being hacked. That's where uh, uh, the likes of Target and Home Depot can look at the data they collect off of all of your purchases and recommend to you things that you should buy. All those advertisements you guys get at home, those aren't random advertisements. Most of it is based on what you've purchased before and they will then send you recommendations of what to purchase based on what you purchased before. They try to guess your income levels. They try to guess who your friends are. They try to guess uh, what you like based on as many patterns as they can extract, which means they have a complete profile of you or as complete of a profile that they can build off of you based on the data that is available to them. Some of that is based off of your purchases. Some of that is based off of when you entered their store. If you guys have ever signed up for cards, Everybody have a Harris Teeter card here or a Harris Teeter account? They have now your address, they have your zip code, they know all your neighbors. All this information is collected and then what they do is they go through it and they try to identify what is it that you should purchase. And it's a common, it's a very, very common thing nowadays. There's, there's no privacy anymore. So Quran comes and says, we bring examples that are mutashabih so that you can have a flexibility. 
So that way you can now come and define my life or my condition is object B. The Quran is object A. I need to find a way to be able to bridge between object B and object A because that's what will help me identify what I should do next in a certain situation. If my, if my current time and my position looks like the time of Hazrat Yusuf, then I should use that story as an example. And I should see what Hazrat Yusuf did in a certain scenario and try to translate that back to my own life. If it's similar to that of Hazrat Musa when he uh, was with his family, uh, out in the desert when Allah called him to go and bring uh, uh, something warm back to his family, if that's the condition that I'm in that's most similar to me, then I should see what are the different rivayat that come about about that situation to try to identify what I should do there. I think for a lot of the young folks, for those who are looking to get married, there are many stories in the Quran about how uh, uh, marriage takes place. Try to identify similar principles between yourself and those stories, and then identify what the appropriate level of progression is there. You'll see that with the story of Hazrat Musa, when he went to, uh, he had left the kingdom, and he went towards, um, I believe it was the land of, of uh, Palestine at that time, in that area, uh, where he met Hazrat Shu'aib to uh, ask for his daughter. You notice there was a pact, there was a ahd between the future son-in-law, Hazrat Musa, and the father-in-law. Where if you come and work for me for Thamaniya Hijaj, that is a good Mehriya. But then the father-in-law did what I think most folks in the Middle East would do, added two years on top of that after eight years was finished. Okay, at the end, Hazrat Musa ended up working 10 years to be able to account for the deal that he had with Hazrat Shu'aib for his daughter's hand in marriage. So there are certain rituals and principles that took place between the future son-in-law and the father-in-law at the time, and if that is the condition that is set forth, you have to be able to try and identify this similarity between what happened then and where you are now. Now there's a risk, there's a huge risk and the Qur'an calls out only the risk. It doesn't call out the benefit yet. The big risk, and you notice it brings the risk first. It doesn't bring the benefit first. The big risk here is that Hassan, the people who want to cause issues and problems in a community or in a in a company or in a family, they will jump on these mutashabih ayahs and start to apply them incorrectly or start to tafsir them incorrectly. They will have a time that doesn't match with the ayah and they'll try to force a match. I think we're all witness to this within our own communities as well. The very principle we said between Shia and Sunni yesterday is a difference of time between what happened. Does Islam require election or selection? And the answer is it is both. At a certain time it requires election and then at a certain other time it requires selection. And so if you apply the principles incorrectly or if you jump on the wrong ayahs at the wrong time in the wrong conditions, it could lead to a huge number of issues. So why not then just be direct? Why not completely get rid of this mutashabe and just tell me? Just tell me, you want me to do this and you don't want me to do this. How easy would life have been? I know I'm required to do namaz five times a day. Great, I'll do it. I know I'm required to uh, uh, fast in the month of Ramadan, okay, I'll do it. See how easy it is? But the description of uh, a certain set of things, such as asking for hand in marriage, such as uh, to who should sadaqah be given. There are certain rules that come and say, okay, uh, uh, there are certain folks 
that we can focus on, but the interpretation of those folks is at times left up to, up to us or up to the scholars. Why didn't the Quran just be direct? And I think it's the one thing that even in conversation with a lot of my friends from, from Christianity, particularly Catholicism, that allows Islam to stand out. That I think Islam in the West has gotten a label that is completely incorrect. And that is that it holds its people who follow it away from freedom. When this ayah is the very essence of what Islam allows as freedom. It provides a nice balance between what can be expressed, what can be applied at a certain time, and still stay within the bounds of the religion but allowing it to change over time and place. There is some stuff that may be haram we said right now in Iran that that same thing here in the United States is not haram because you're in two different places. There are some things that used to be haram at the time of the Prophet that today may not be haram. You say, what the, is the religion changing? What's halal and haram? The answer is no. The religion is not changing what's halal and haram. The principle of what was halal and haram has remained the same. The ruk is the same. That bound hasn't moved. The application of that bound, though, in our current time is different. And so it looks like the bounds have moved, but the answer is no, the bounds have stayed fixed. What has moved are the points that are within that bound. Some have moved out of the box, some have moved in the box, and that's perfectly fine. It allows the religion to keep up with the time, to keep up with the communities, with the people. It allows everybody to be able to practice it. That's why we have such a diverse group of Muslims. For those who, inshallah, have the opportunity this year to go to Hajj, you'll get to experience this firsthand. You will bump into, during Tawaf, easily, easily, to people from a hundred different countries. Easily. One round, not even all seven rounds. All seven rounds is probably 10,000 people you'll bump into. In one round of Tawaf, you will bump into probably people from a hundred different countries. How is that possible? Well, it's because, and if you go visit the Catholic Church in Rome, you won't bump into anybody. They're a little better organized. But you won't have that diverse of a population there at any point. Whereas in Hajj, as well as in Arba'in, for uh, uh, Shahadat Imam Hussein, you'll have the same experience. How is it? Well, it's because everybody can take this religion, identify the bounds appropriately, and practice it in some practical way. What's hard now, what's really hard, particularly for those of us who are a bit younger and are trying to adhere to the religion while working here in the West, is that the experts that are deciphering the rules of these ayahs that are mutashabih are particularly unfamiliar with a lot of conditions and times in the West. So it makes it harder at times for us to accept or adhere to certain principles. Inshallah that changes in the future but at the current time, that's, that's the situation we're in. If we don't like it, we have to start sponsoring schools to build experts who are more familiar with the times and customs in the States or in the West to be able to allow the expression of these, application of these rules better for us. But we don't have that right now. So it makes it hard. And it's fine. It's one of the sacrifices we have to make one of the quote-unquote jihad akbar.
So that's the benefit. And you can see that this benefit allows for the existence of the religion to continue over space and time. And that will outweigh any risk, any risk. So Allah has put two principles in place. And he's listed both of those in this ayah. In Surah Ala Imran, ayah 7. First is he allows for ayat al-mutashabih. And how does he hold that down? وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ The Rasikhuna fil ilm will be able to hold this religion to a point where we'll make sure that these folks who are after the fitna and the incorrect interpretation of specific verses to wipe out their, their effect. It'll take time, it won't be easy, but it'll happen. How do they do it? Yaguluna amanna bihi kullum min indi rabbina. So that's to sum up what we talked about yesterday. All of this is from the first third of the responsibilities of the Quran as per Surah Isra, ayah number 9. هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوام. So that way we could move to the second responsibility. Please send aloud salawat. The second responsibility. وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا The second thing the Quran has to do, and again you notice the fail is brought in Muzara sense. يُبَشِّرْ بِشَارَتْ مِدَهَدْ The key, الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So it gives great tidings to a specific group of people. Not muttaqin, not muslimin, not all of the people, not linnas, to a specific group. That specific group is وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Who are these people? الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ Those ones who do good deeds and actions. If only this ayah elaborated on that. You know, kian. Who are these people that are the mu'mineen that are doing these great deeds and what are they doing? Maybe I can do it. If only there was a surah that whose title was mu'minun that would list out these actions that mu'mineen are doing. And we have that. We have a surah called Surah Mu'minun that lists as Ayah Dr. Mir Baghari said the dune durasht haye ya'maluna salahat what are the low hanging fruit the really important things that mu'mineen should be doing and that's listed out for us one by one in Surah Mu'minun. We'll just hop through the list so that way it's it's here. The surah starts off, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. Perfect. In the very first ayah, it talks about rastagariya Mu'minun. It talks about the success of the Mu'mins. So hopefully in this ayah, it comes and describes who these people are and what they're doing. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ The people who in their salat, in their namaz, they have khushu. They're not among the people who are part of that famous, uh, I don't know if it's Iranian joke or if it's a Muslim joke, زبود, he was in an airplane, he was doing his prayer, or he was in an airport doing his prayer, they said, ajab namazi, and he turned around and said, ruzam hastam. So not that. So within their salat, they have khushu. They're humble. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِدُونَ Second. 
within uh, uh, towards things that are larv eteros mikoran. They'll stop it. They'll stay away from it. They won't allow it to penetrate their communities. And we'll leave the definition of larv. That's one of those uh, ask the expert thing. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ They tend to their zakat. They give out their charities. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِذُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ فَمَنْ اِبْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْعَادُونَ then we'll finish the other two and I'll come back to this one. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَأَهْدِهِمْ رَاؤُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِذُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ So he lists one, two, three, four, five, six. Six different things that make up يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ To only one of them He's given three ayahs. Everything else gets one ayah. Salat to khushu is the second ayah. Laghv mu'adidun is one ayah. It's the, it's the third ayah. Zakat fa'ilun is again one ayah. But when he comes to lifurujihim hafidun, he gives it that ayah. He gives it illa ala azwajihim aw ma malakat aymanuhum fa innahum ghayru malumin. And then he also gives it, فَمَنِ ابْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الْعَادِلِ To this notion of, we'll label very broadly here, مَحْرَمِيَّتْ For mu'mineen, Allah puts three ayahs of emphasis. That's three times as much as any of the other ones. Granted, it's in the order number three, but the emphasis is three times as big. says for uh, uh, if you go look at some other ayahs in the Quran you have specific rules and rituals for how males are supposed to do لفروجهم hafidun, and then you also have specific rules and rituals for females to do لفروجهم hafidun. but what's interesting here is that also it doesn't leave it there he draws the bounds for this one specific one because it's as if Allah knew when this ayah was revealed Depending on the place this person is going to be at, this one's going to be hard. For ladies to wear the headscarf here in the West, you can probably find nine out of ten women across all of the folks in the, in, in, in particularly from the Western population of Muslims, that would have gone through one or some encounter of having a difficult time, some Somebody looked at them the wrong way. Somebody made fun of them if they were in school. Something happened, whether they knew it or not. But Allah says, stand steadfast to this. So he details a description of lifurujihim hafidun. Don't objectify women or men. Allah draws the bounds for you for that objectification. You don't have to do this towards malakat aymanuhum fa'innahum ghayru malumin or your azwaj or your spouse. But for those who want to go beyond that and only beyond that, those are the two groups. Fa'ula'ika humul adun. Those guys have gone too far. Anybody who goes beyond furujahim hafidun for these two groups. Not doing furujah hafidun uh, other than for these two groups. So the social aspect of the interactions between men and women, Islam tries to put some extra hand of caution in. That when this interaction is occurring, be, be vigilant. Be careful. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. That doesn't mean it can't happen. Some places where when I go to a conference or a seminar, you notice 
Um, if I'm at an academic conference where it's uh, uh, non-religiously affiliated, as you walk into an elevator, you walk out of an elevator, whether it's men or women walking uh, uh, within the elevator or out, they're walking in a hallway, there's always a good morning, good afternoon, hello, how are you? There's, there's some level of small talk, which is nice, it's good. It builds you know, whatever social skills that um, these people have. But when you're in an Islamic conference, that happens a lot less. We take it, I think, at least too extreme. Everybody's heads are always down. They don't, we're not even ready to say salam to each other. That's too far. That will, in those cases, yes, salam is there's there's nothing, no harm in it. You're not going to breach furuj hafidun by doing a salam. Or asking how the person is. So long as we're vigilant. You don't want to take it too far. But it'll build social rapport. Particularly for those people who are, you know, within more Islamic communities for, for longer periods of time when they go out uh, to work, you're not in an Islamic community. You need to be able to uh, not segment in your mind, okay, I'm here at IEC, I'm going to act one way, and when I'm at work, I'm going to act another way. You're on a slippery slope if you're doing that. There needs to be a uniform person, whether you're at IEC or whether you're out. So if you want to say hi, hello to people out, practice it here. Same thing, vice versa. Things you practice here, whether it's through fasting, whether it's through your prayers, whether it's through the timeliness of your prayers, practice it out there. But there is that flexibility. So that's on the furujihim hafidun side. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَأَحْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ so the amanat, when people give us amana from most of the people I know in the community, alhamdulillah, if somebody lets you borrow their car, fill it up with gas, give it back. If somebody um, asks you to hold something for them, take care of it, that, those are the obvious ones. The ones that I found particularly problematic in Islamic communities is ahdihim ra'un. Ahdihim ra'un, particularly when it comes to punctuality. If you tell me you're going to meet me at 6 o'clock, then please, God, meet me at 6 o'clock. Not 6.05, not 6.30, not 10 p.m., but 6. It's an ahd between us. It's a qarardad between us. You told me you're coming, so I'll be here at 6. Show up at 6. You notice, I think the only time Muslims become extremely timely is the month of Ramadan. I was with uh, one of my friends. He said, uh, you know, somebody came and asked, why is it only in the month of Ramadan it's difficult to identify when the month starts and when it ends? It's like, no, dude. <laughs> We have this problem all 12 months. It's not only in the month. That you're noticing that we have this issue in the month of Ramadan. Because you want to make sure you don't fast an extra day. You want to make sure you start on time and you end on time. And the excuse we have, now, Ruz Eid Haram Ruz Get out of here. Most of them would believe me, we wouldn't do it. Allah gave us one day or two days in the year. The rest of the year, we're all fasting. Only those two days we can't fast. And then the second time we become punctual is Mughayaftar. God help Hajar Bahraini if he starts namaz five minutes late. I think just two nights ago, I was standing up here up front. Every, and now what's nice is everybody has smartphones who has different settings on the Al-Qibla app. 
یکی نمیدونم هشت و نیم آلارمش میره یکی هشت و پنجا هاجا نشده give it a rest when he says افتار just stand up and do نماز and do your افتار عهد هم را اونه punctuality if we can start to fix that there is a lot of other problems within our communities that would also be addressed showing appreciation of other people's time and then it again this one ends walladhina hum ala salawatihim yuhafidun in this case in the first ayah it said salatihim khashun in this one it says salawatihim yuhafidun salawat here is plural unlike the first one it has two types you have the one the namaz and the other one is salawat bar muhammad o al muhammad If you read through these nine verses in Surah Mu'minun, you'll see the only place where there is a verb is yuhafidun. And it's again a continuous verb. Everything else is a either ism fa'il or ism maf'ul. Ra'un, fa'ilun, adun. So these other things have to be baked into our essence. They need to become who we are. As bas bad anjam bidin that it becomes a part of us. You can't separate salat khashun from yourself. This one has to be an action that is continuous. Both the namaz and the salawat bar Muhammad al Muhammad. And if all of these conditions occur, in this surah it comes and says, Ula humul warithun. These are the people who will take a great ihs. They will have the great inheritance. That inheritance is twofold. One, if we come back to Surah Esra, it comes and says, Anna lahum ajran kabira. The second one is you read in Surah Qasas. وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُدْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَوْهُمْ أَئِمَّ وَنَجْعَلَوْهُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ Those people who are mustaz'af and their savior comes back to them and who have the ability to recognize him and join him, they will inherit the lands. And that is none other in the story directly as Hazrat Musa, but if you take it as an ayah mutashabih, Mufassirin have translated that to Imam Mahdi Ajalallah Ta'ala Faraj wa Shaykh. So if we adhere to these nine principles, or in this case eight, less, because three of them are for one, six, six principles. You're among the Mu'min. Nicely simple and laid out. Some of them have to be practiced so much that they become a part of your essence. And others should be practiced even after they become part of your essence continuously. That was the second responsibility of the Quran as listed in Surah Isra Ayah 9. The third one it leaves out the verb we are at 8.18. It's going to take too long to open up the third responsibility. Inshallah, we'll do that some other time. So that, inshallah, we all have the ability in this grand month to become a part of the mu'minin, that these six actions become easy for us. They become a part of our lives. The best time to practice it is the month of Ramadan. And Nesfish Kozash. 50% of it's done. We have 50% left. Tonight's the birth of Imam Hassan. We have Shawaya Qadr ahead of us for three grand nights. Alhamdulillah, do all in these nights. Let's remember those who have passed on. 
اللهم رب شهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن وافترضت على عبادك فيه الصيام صل على محمد وآل محمد وارزقنا حج بيتك الحرام في عامنا هذا وفي كل عام واغفر لنا تلك الذنوب العظام فإنه لا يغفرك غيرك يا رحمن يا علام بر محمد و آل محمد صلوات بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم سلام علیکم و رحمت الله چون وقت هنوز هست یه چند دقیقه من تو این چند دقیقه مزاحم شما میشم و میلاد امام حسن مجتبا علیه السلام رو خدمت همه شما تبریک عرض میکنم امشب شب میلاد اون بزرگوار هست و من به یک آیه ای از قرآن اشاره میکنم که همه شما این آیه رو شنیدید و آیه در رابطه با اهل بیت علیهم السلام ما تفسیر این آیه رو شبهای سهشنبه در برنامه جلسه قرآنی داشتیم و تعداد محدودی از شما توی این جلسه تشریف داشتید این آیه در سوره احزاب همش خطاب به همسران پیغمبر است یا نسا النبی یا نسا النبی و یک مرتبه در بین همه این خطابها دو تا قطعه قرآن مطرح میکنه یکی مسئله اهل بیت و یکی مسئله قرآن و در حقیقت میگوید که شما در یک خانواده ای هستید که خداوند اراده کرده است که هیچ رجز هیچ آلودگی هیچ پلیدی در این خانواده نباشد آن آیه انما یرید الله لیذهب چی ان کمود ریتس اهل البیت یعنی این انما از عدات حصر انحصاریه یعنی کسان دیگه نه منحصر هست توی این گروهی که قرآن داره اشاره میکنه دوم این است که خدا اراده کرده یعنی خدا خواسته که اینها متحر باشد 
این اراده اراده تکوینی اراده تکوینی یعنی نه این جینها نتوانند از حالت تهارت و پاکی خارج بشن نه اینها تمام آلودگی ها رو در اون اعلاش میبینند و من یه مثال میزدم توی مسجد شما یک لیوانی رو اگر توش یه قطره خون بریزید خیلی ممکنه معلوم نشه یا یک قطره نجاست بریزی توی لیوان معلوم نشه اینو بدید دست یک کسی خب نمیدونه این آلودگی داره می آشامد اما اون کسی که می تواند آلودگی را ببیند اون قطعا نمی آشامد این اراده اراده تکوینی خداست که اینها همه آلودگی ها رو می بینند و به این دلیل از آلودگی ها دوری می کنند اراده خدا بر این قرار گرفته لیوزه به انکمور ریتس از شما همه پلیدی ها رو دور بکنه کی اهل البیت اونایی که توی خونه هستن اهل اون خونه یعنی اون خونه ای که الان حرم پیغمبر هست الان زریه پیغمبره توی اون خونه کسانی که بودند مشخصند بعد لیو تحرکم تطهیرا کلمه تطهیرای بعد و بعد از یو تحرکم میاره در واقع مفعول مطلق تأکیدی میاره یعنی فقط اینها بر اساس اراده الهی پاک و متحرند بعد کنار اینها قرآن رو مطرح میکنه آیه بعدیشی حالا توی این دقایقی که وقت هست من میخوام مطالبی رو عرض بکنم این که برای ما ائمه اطهار علیهم السلام همشون مساوی از نظر پاک بودن و این پاکی یکی از کسانی که توی اون خونه اون موقع بود این آیه نازل شد امام حسن مشتبه علیه السلام بود کیا رفتن مدینه توی جلسه اونایی که مدینه رفتن دستشون بگیرن بالا بعد اونایی هم که نرفتن آقای اسلامی هست ثبت نام میکنه ان شاءالله میرن اما این ذریه پیغمبر رو که شما نگاه بکنید نصفش منزل پیغمبر بوده اون نصف بالاییش منزل علی ابن ابی طالب علیه السلام بوده و هر روز که پیامبر صبحا از منزل می اومده بیرون و منزل علی ابن عبی طالب رو مورد خطاب قرار می داده که به عنوان اهل البیت اینا روایات توی اهل سنت هست که اونا رو مورد خطاب قرار می داده به عنوان این که وقت نماز صبح داره فرا می رسه اهل بیت همه مردم چون اصحاب صفه هم اونجا هن. اون سکوهایی که هست توی مسجد و نبی اون سکوها مال اصحاب صفه هیه. یعنی یه ادهی همراه پیغمبر اومده بودن از مکه به عنوان مهاجرین اومده بودن مدینه توی مدینه اینا جا نداشتن که اینا مجبور بودن همون کنار مسجد نبی یا تو همون مسجد نبی بنشینن یه جایی مثلا همونجا بخوابن شبا این سکوها الان میگن اصحاب صفه اینا اونجا بودن اینا همه میشنیدن بعد روایات بسیار زیاد از اهل سنت از اهل تشیع میگه که اهل بیتی که در این آیه آمد 
اینها پنج تن آل عبا بودند که به عنوان اصحاب کسا مطرح شدند کیا بودند علی و فاطمه حسن و حسین و رسول الله یعنی امام حسن که ما الان شب میلادش هستیم جز اون اهل بیتی بوده که در اون موقع این آیه در شعن ایشون نازل شده خب حالا ما هستیم و ماه مبارک نزدیک شبهای قدر داریم میریم به سمت شبهای قدر امشب میخوایم دست به دامن امام حسن مجتبا علیه السلام متوسل بشیم و خدا را به این نور پاک به این شخص متحر به این ولی خدا به این انسان ملکوتی به این انسان الهی قسم بدیم که توی این جمع افرادی هستند که حاجتی دارند خواسته ای دارند امشب به امام مجتبا یه نظری بکنید یه نیتی بکنید برای امام مجتبا علیه السلام و با خدا در میون بگذاری بگید خدایا در قرآنت فرمودی اینها متحرند اینها پاکند به امام حسن مجتبا تو را قسم میدهیم در این شب 